I want your soul. Ian, did you hear the captain calling? Carter asked. I moved my gaze from the notes on my desk and looked in his direction. He was standing by the entrance to my room, hands on his hips. He looked furious and impatient. No, I didn't. What's going on? We have an emergency. HQ wants to send us on a rescue mission. A rescue? For who? I raised my eyebrows. No idea. The briefing's already started. Come on. Let's get to the control room. Before I could ask him anything else, he turned and went down the hallway. I arranged my notes neatly and exited my room. The corridor leading down echoed with my footsteps and Carter's own in the distance. The spaceship was big enough for me to still sometimes lose direction, but at least it was equipped with gravitational panels, so we could get around more easily without floating and getting disoriented, like in the early stages of the simulation. I turned right at the corner and saw Carter stopping in front of the control room door. He turned around and waited for me to get closer. Once I did, he pressed the big square button next to the door, which made it slide sideways. Immediately, we were hit by the sound of murmurs, as our other crew members discussed something around the holographic map in the middle. Behind the crew was a row of control panels, sitting in front of a huge pane of glass. I glanced at the dark space beyond the glass, filled with hundreds of stars in the distance, unreachable still to mankind. It often made me realize how insignificant we are and how easily we can get swept away in an instant, in this cold abyss, and no one would ever even know. I was shaken back to reality by Captain Adams' stern voice. Ian, late again, I see. Sit down. The crew consisted of six members altogether, and we had mandatory meetings every morning and evening to go through the list of inspections. So when Carter called me for an unexpected meeting at 5 p.m., I knew something must have gone terribly wrong. I sat down and waited for the captain to speak. Earlier today, there was an incident on board the ISS-14. We don't know what exactly happened, but supposedly there are casualties and Earth lost contact with them. HQ wants us to go there immediately and provide rescue to anyone alive. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That place is very far away the team medic Riley said. It'll take us at least a few hours to get there, and we're not rescue services either. Yeah, but there's no one closer to them than us. Now, I know that this is not our line of work, but it has to be us. We go there, look for any survivors, and we go back home. Wait, wait a minute. What about the mining operation? James asked. HQ wants us to put it on hold. Right now, the priority is rescuing the ISS-14 crew and escorting them back home. Immediately, as I said. Okay, all right, I'll start the engine up, Hank the pilot exclaimed. He then stood up and went to the control panel with Carter, and the two of them pressed a series of buttons. Every crew member was trained to pilot the ship, but only Carter and Hank could do it outside of any emergency situations. The ship hummed to life, and the floor under our feet slightly vibrated. The view outside started rotating to the right, making the stars dance across the window. When it stopped, it was impossible to tell which direction we were facing. However, the pilots somehow knew it from the radar and were able to determine which direction to move in. The ship started moving forward slowly, but gained speed gradually. It looked as if we were pinned in one spot, but I knew with each second passing, we were covering miles of the inhospital vacuum of space. Hank leaned back in his chair. We should be there in about three hours. Well, keep your eyes open, the captain said, and try and see if you can get in contact with them in the meantime. He then stood up and left the room. I followed and went back to the crew quarters. I closed the shutters on my window and sat down on my bed. Although some of the crew members enjoyed the unique view from the windows in the rooms, I tended to avoid gazing outside, especially if I was left alone with my thoughts. Staring out into the endless nothingness for prolonged periods of time made me feel claustrophobic and trapped. 
I knew we were relatively close to home, but our planet was only visible as a tiny dot in the distance at any given time, with every direction around us being infinite miles of empty space. For the first few days, I'd glance through the window towards the Earth every few hours, afraid that our ship would drift and we'd lose sight of our planet, getting lost forever in the unforgiving cold dark, so unknown to man. I knew, of course, no such thing could really happen, but the nagging feeling wouldn't abate. After a while of sitting on my bed, I went to join Hank and Carter in the control room. So, I was just telling Carter that the guys on the ISS-14 are probably just blackout drunk. You know, something silly like that. Hank then chuckled and craned his neck in my direction. What about you? What do you think? I don't know, man. It's strange to just lose contact like that. I mean, they might have a serious issue. Well, whatever the case, we'll find out soon. We're almost there. You see that? Carter said and then pointed out the window. I squinted and realized that he was pointing at a dot in the distance. As minutes went by, the dot grew closer and more and more prominent shapes gradually became apparent. It began to take the shape of a man-made flying object, and I recognized its disproportionately large wings as solar panels, reflecting sunlight. It's still there and it seems to be intact, Hank said. He then leaned in and pressed a button on the control panel. And as he held it like that, he stated, We can see them. Everybody needs to get down here now. In a matter of minutes, everyone was in the control room and the ISS-14 was a lot closer and bigger, displaying more and more visible details on the structure, like joints, pressurized modules, and more. Then Adams pressed a button on the panel as well. This is the U.S. Collector 03. Does anybody on board copy? He released the button and we all waited in silence. Nothing but the humming of the ship was heard. Adams pressed the button and spoke again. This is the U.S. Collector 03. ISS 14. Do you copy? No response. Adams then sighed. Well, I guess we're going in. Bring us in closer, Hank. Then he looked at me. Ian, you need to suit up. I gave him a silent nod of agreement and proceeded to the lockers. I donned my suit and put my helmet on. I double-checked if the thrusters on the boots were functioning, refilled the oxygen tank, and made sure everything was tightly secured. Once that was done, I proceeded down to the airlock. Riley was waiting in front and inspected my gear once more to make sure everything was safe. All right, you're good to go, she said, giving me a pat on the shoulder. I pressed the button to open the airlock and stepped inside. In front of me was the second airlock door and a small round window, the final line of defense that separated me from a potentially painful device. Riley pressed the button again and sealed the door behind me. I attached the safety cord to my suit and pulled down the lever on the left side of the wall. A computerized voice then announced, Depressurizing airlock, stand by. I glanced through the round window facing the interior of the ship and smiled at Riley. I'll be back in a bit, I said encouragingly. I pressed the button next to the second door, and it opened with a hiss and instantly everything except my breathing went silent. The weight of my body was lifted and I was floating in midair. I used the thrusters to propel myself out of the airlock and finally stepped into the vast, empty space. That initial moment felt nauseating at first leaping out of the spaceship and expecting to see ground beneath you, but instead being met with an endless abyss which threatened to swallow you whole. The ISS-14 towered above me now, much larger up close than I suspected it would be, a silent behemoth which took up almost the entire view in front. The docking bay was right in front of me, so I proceeded there as quickly as the thrusters would allow. Despite being able to go only 8 miles per hour, I didn't worry about the speed, since I had enough oxygen to go for at least 6 hours, so hopefully I'd be back to the ship by then. Ian, do you copy? Carter's voice came through the radio. Yep, yep, I hear you loud and clear. Alright, listen. We scan the area with thermals and there's no sign of anybody being alive on board the station. What? Are you sure? You don't think the device malfunctioned? How could there be nobody here? No, no, definitely not. Because we picked up a sign of life outside the ship. 
Uh, repeat that last statement. There's indication that one of the crew members is spacewalking outside the ship. See that gray node just around the upper right-hand solar panel? He should be right over there. Uh, okay, roger that, I said, and I looked up. Beyond the top of the station was exactly what was under it, endless, vast void. It was a long ascend, especially because of the speed of the thrusters, but I slowly made my way up. Halfway there, I stopped at the site in front of me. Holy shit, I mumbled. Ian, you okay? James asked. I stared in bewilderment, unable to respond. The airlock which led inside the station was wide open. That was not uncommon if astronauts went on repair missions which were short. But what bothered me here was the fact that both airlock doors were wide open, letting out all the air completely. Guys, something bad happened here. Both airlock doors are wide open. There was silence on the other end until Riley simply uttered a dumbfounded, What? Probably human error, I said. No, that's impossible. The system would have warned them tenfold, Adam scoffed. You'd have to be a complete idiot, suicidal even, to make a mistake like that. Well, then I can't explain this, I said and continued ascending. Pretty soon I reached the top and had a good view of the entire station. The place seemed completely undamaged, so it made sense to me that someone simply made a mistake when opening the airlock. Any signs of survivors? I overheard Adams asking and I scanned the area and at first saw nothing. And then I noticed it. An astronaut, blended with the white exterior of the station, just floating around, upside down. He showed no signs of movement so I assumed he was either dead or unconscious. Yeah, yeah, I think I see something. Hold on a minute. Give me a second. I leaned forward and activated the thrusters once more. As I got closer, I tried to speak into the radio to avoid startling the crew member, in case he was still alive. This is Ian Nielsen. Does anyone from the ISS-14 copy? As I suspected, there was no response, so I simply went on. We're here to rescue you. Try not to move while I attach the safety cord to your suit. I got close enough to the astronaut to grab his hand and turn him around. I saw a man underneath the helmet, seemingly sleeping peacefully. His forehead and the inside of his helmet had blood on them and I would have thought he was dead had I not seen the helmet getting fogged up every few seconds from his steady breathing. He had a name tag on his chest that said, Harrington. Control, I found one. He's alive, but he seems to be injured. All right, bring him back and we'll decide later what to do with the station, Adam said. I detached the safety cord from myself and attached it to the astronaut. I held the cord with one hand and pressed the button on it. It began slowly pulling the both of us back towards the ship. All right, I got him. We're heading back now. I stared at the ISS-14 as it grew distant again occasionally glancing at Harrington to see if he was still breathing. We had passed by the open airlock, and I kept squinting at it, mesmerized and trying to take a closer look, but it was too dark. When it was out of my line of sight, I glanced back at him. His eyes were wide open, and he was staring at me now. I stared at him for a while, not sure if he was dead or alive or catatonic, but then I saw him blink, and he started darting his eyes around frantically. I finally snapped out of my trance and said, Hey, it's okay. You're safe now. I'm from the Collector 03, and we were sent to rescue you. Harrington then mumbled timidly. Rescue? Yeah, that's right. I don't know what happened here, but you seem to be the only survivor. I'm bringing you back to our ship. At this sentence, Harrington's eyes widened even more, and he started panting. Within seconds, he was writhing and screaming in my arms, shouting into coherent words. He almost shook me off the cord, and I tried calming him down, but it was hard with the noise of radio voices asking what was going on and Harrington screaming and squirming. Hey, hey, calm down, man, calm down. I tried to hold him still, but it was impossible. Don't do it, 
Don't bring them back to the ship. I managed to hear those words among all the incoherence in Harrington's sentences. There's no one else left of your crew, Harrington. You're the only survivor. I'm not bringing anyone back. I shouted, but he continued to ignore me. And then he started coughing violently. Droplets of blood splashed the inside of his helmet, adding to the other already dried blood. He had a coughing fit for about half a minute and he took a few deep breaths. Then his eyes closed and he seemingly lost consciousness again. Ian, report, damn it! Adam shouted over the radio. It took me a moment to compose myself and then I answered. I think he has internal bleeding. We need to hurry. Riley, get the first aid kit ready as soon as I come in. On it, Riley responded. Within minutes, Harrington and I were back in the airlock. I pressed the button and closed the external door and pressurized the chamber, putting Harrington in a laying down position. As soon as the internal door opened, the crew rushed in and put Harrington on a stretcher, carrying him to the infirmary. I took off my helmet and with the suit still on, followed them. Get his suit off now, Riley's voice echoed through the ship. Harrington was lying on his back on a table, Riley on the side of it, taking off his helmet. I got to the other side of the table and helped him take the suit off. When I reached to help them take his garments off, though, the astronaut firmly gripped my wrist like a vice. Our eyes met, and again he had that same petrified look on his face as before. He mumbled something, but I couldn't understand it. And I leaned in and I told him to repeat what he said. You brought them back, he stated in a trembling voice. I looked down in time to see Riley take off Harrington's garment, and an audible scream was heard from her, along with gasps from the other crew members. When I looked down, I could hardly comprehend what I was seeing. Harrington had a gaping hole in his stomach, and in it, hundreds of thousands of maggots were squirming around, eating away at his wound. They started hopping some managing to jump onto Riley's arm. She screamed and violently swatted at them, making a break for the exit. Harrington then started coughing again, more violently than ever. Just before he stopped moving completely, the blood from his cough spurted over my suit and I recoiled backwards. When I looked down, I nearly started screaming. Along with the blood, there were crimson maggots slithering towards my head. I swatted at them, disgusted, and in a panic at the same time. Get, get them the fuck out of here, Adam shouted. We didn't need any more encouragement. We rushed outside, and once everybody was out, we pressed the button to lock the door. We glanced through the glass on the door at Harrington's body, and more and more maggots squirmed out of his wound, impossibly many to fit into his stomach alone, swarming his exposed body parts and feasting away on his remains. Is everybody okay? Did anybody get bit? I heard Adam shout. Most of us nodded. Riley, what the hell was that? Beads of sweat forming on her temples. Riley opened her mouth as if to say something, her gaze still fixed on the infirmary. She shook her head without saying anything, though. How, how the hell did those maggots get on him? Even if he had a necrotic wound, there's no way so many maggots could just come out of his stomach like that. Well, the only explanation is he or one of the crew members were infected and it got out of control. Either way, it doesn't matter now. We need to get in touch with HQ and explain what's going on here. Adams then turned around and left the corridor, and everybody else started towards the control room after him. Riley and I were at the back, and as she started down the corridor, I grabbed her arm, a little firmer than I had intended to. She then shot me a look of confusion, and I stared at her exposed forearm. Riley, those maggots touched you. Did they bite? I asked quiet enough for others not to hear. No, she said and jerked her arm free of my grip and looked at me as if she was offended. You think I'd jeopardize the whole crew like that, Ian? No, I don't, I don't know, I just... And what about you? The ISS member coughed up some maggots on you, didn't it? No, I'm clean, I'm positive, I said and our eyes were locked. She crossed her arms and seemed to calm down after a minute. Well, we should all get tested anyway, but we don't have the necessary equipment here. Right, right, that's, that's true, 
Our priority should be contacting HQ and getting back. If any of us are infected, they can quarantine us. She then nodded and motioned to me to join the rest of the crew. We entered the control room and heard Carter's voice on the other end of it. This is the U.S. Collector 03. HQ, do you copy? This is HQ. What's your situation, Collector? The crackly voice came through the radio. HQ, this is Captain Adams. We arrived at the site of the ISS-14. Everyone but one crew member was dead, mysteriously. We managed to bring the crew member back on board, but he also died shortly after. There was a brief moment of pause before HQ responded. What happened? Well, we don't know for sure. The crew member we brought back seems to have been infected. He had flesh-eating maggots under his suit. We had to seal off the infirmary, since we don't know the extent of the threat. Understood. Collector, right now your priority is sterilizing the contaminated areas in case these maggots can do some serious damage to the vessel. Once you've done that, haul your ass back to base so we can quarantine and treat you if necessary. We're sending someone out there right now. Copy that, HQ. Collector out. Adams then turned to us with his typical stern look and said, Well, you heard it. Let's sterilize that infirmary. Hank then pressed a button on the control panel. When nothing happened, he pressed it again. He flipped a switch up and down and pressed the button once more before he started repeatedly slamming it. What's going on, Hank? Hank then pressed the button a few more times before answering. I don't know, the sterilization isn't working. The button's not responding. All right, we'll then try some of the other rooms. Hank did that and pressed various other buttons, but it still didn't work. Adam sighed and then turned to James. James, I need you to put on the hazmat suit and go decontaminate the infirmary manually. No fucking way, man, James rebutted. Have you seen what those angry little fuckers can do? I'm not going in there. You'll do your goddamn job. Ames got into James's face now. Besides, the suit will protect you. He then turned to Hank and Carter. You two start that motherfucking engine. Might as well get going while we're doing this. Then he turned around to approach the holographic map on the table when Carter spoke. Uh, Captain? We have a problem because the engine won't start. What do you mean it won't start? I just told you to start it. I mean it's not fucking turning on, Carter blurted out. There was a moment of intense silence in the room, and Adams rubbed his chin and then turned to me. Ian, go check the engine now, but put that protection suit on just in case. I gave him a silent nod of agreement and left the room. The temperature seemed to change. James then followed behind me as well. This is total bullshit. He threw up his hands in the air as we made our way to the lockers. Suck it up, James. The sooner we finish our job, the sooner we can get the fuck out of here. We donned our protective suits and inspected each other for potential faults, and once we were sure everything was okay, I picked up my tools and we went our merry ways. My job was to go onto the ship's bottom floor and inspect the engine, and to do that, I had to remove the floor panel and climb down. As I did so and entered the corridor, I heard James's trembling voice on the radio. Holy shit, Captain. I'm in front of the infirmary, and there's more of them in there. What? What do you mean there's more of them in there? Adams asked. I mean there's millions of them, all over the fucking place. I can't even see Harrington's body anymore. My stomach started twisting in knots when I heard it. I didn't like this at all. James, you need to calm down, Adams shouted. Listen, we have to decontaminate that room before they spread to the other parts of the ship. Your suit will protect you. Now pull that switch, wait until the process is done, and get out. All right, all right, James sighed over the radio. I'm going in. Adam spoke to me and asked how things were going on in my end, and I told him I was close to the engine. It was darker down here, so I used a flashlight to illuminate the way to the front. The corridor echoed with the heavy thuds of my footsteps as I made my way through, until I reached the panel above my head, which said do not remove. James, talk to me, Adam said. 
I'm okay, Captain, but I had to stomp all over them. It's disgusting. They seem to be ignoring me, though. Okay, did you pull the switch? No, not yet, but I'm almost... Ah, shit. James, what happened? One of them just fucking bit me. James, that's impossible. They can't get through your suit. There's a fucking hole in my boot. I gotta get out of here. My heart was thumping against my chest rapidly at this point as I had stopped doing my own job and I was now listening to this. My left hand was frozen on the panel and the other on the screw. They're in my suit. Oh my God, James shouted. Get out of there. Get out of the infirmary then. The next few seconds were filled with James's screams over the radio, intermittently getting louder and quieter until he stopped completely. James, are you there? I shouted now, my own voice trembling. There was no response, however. Ian, I need you to get back in the ship now. All right, just give me a second and let me fix the engine. Ian, fuck that engine and get back in here now. Hold on, Adams, if I can't fix the engine, we can't... The panel then partially fell open, stopping me mid-sentence, and when I took the second screw off from the gap, hundreds of red maggots poured through, falling to the ground with wet slumps. I recoiled in fear as the maggots continued to pour out and pile onto the ground in front of me. They started bouncing one by one trying to reach me, and I screamed and bolted for the ladder. All the while, the voices of my crew members echoed through the radio, asking me what I was doing. I climbed up and slammed the floor panel shut, leaving me with only the sound of my own frantic breathing. And then I heard a thud. And then another. And another. In moments, hundreds of thuds were heard on the panel, like the sound of raindrops, and I could see the floor bending outwards under the pressure. Maggots started crawling from under the edges of the dented panel, and I screamed again, running for my dear life. Abandoned ship, I shouted between breaths, looking back behind me. I could already see thousands of maggots on the ground and walls behind. Maggots, maggots are everywhere. Get your suits on now, guys. We have to run. I ran straight to the locker and took off my protective suit, donning the space one instead, my trembling hands making it difficult to suit back up. The rest of the crew members were there in a matter of seconds, putting their own suits on. No time for inspection. Get to the airlock. Adam shouted. I ran out first, rushing down the corridor and stopped when I glanced in the infirmary. James was slumped over the threshold, leaving the door wide open. He had managed to take his suit off down to his waist before he died. Maggots were wiggling inside his empty eye sockets and his teeth were visible due to his lips being completely eaten off. His body and the areas in front and inside the infirmary were crawling with these things, possibly millions piling atop each other on every single surface of the room, making it look like it was moving with their slithering. Adams pushed me and I forced myself to look away and continue running. We rushed inside the airlock and as I turned around, I saw Hank lagging behind, running towards us. His right arm had maggots on it, which he seemingly wasn't aware of. All of us were probably thinking the same thing, but nobody wanted to say it. And that's why Adam stepped up and closed the airlock before Hank could get inside. Hank then slammed the button to open the airlock from the outside, but it wasn't responsive during pressurization. Captain, let me in. They're close. He looked behind at the mass, which drew closer by the second. Hank, I'm so sorry, Adam said. Hank started screaming and flailing his arms, and maggots started appearing in his helmet and he threw it off, trying to run in the opposite direction in a desperate attempt to escape. He never stood a chance, since the maggots swarmed up to his knees in seconds and trapped him like quicksand, before he was completely covered by them. Riley was screaming and crying now, trying to put her hands on her mouth, but unable to do so because of the helmet. The airlock then opened, and all of us went silent again. Never before has the inhospital vacuum of space felt so welcoming. And for a while, we floated in silence, processing what just happened. Then, Adam spoke up, a sentence which sent a chill down my spine so sharply that for a moment, I thought that I myself had maggots in my suit. We need to get to the ISS-14. Riley and I shot each other a confused stare, but said nothing. Adams was already well on his way to the airlock, 
of the ISS-14, slowly propelling himself with his thrusters. Carter followed closely behind and soon, the entire group of survivors was unanimously headed towards the silent behemoth of a ship. Captain, there might be maggots on there, I said through the radio. I know that, but some of us are low on oxygen. We need to replenish and, if possible, repressurize the station. We need to contact HQ and warn them of the dangers here before those maggots spread. Even though no one responded, it was clear that we all agreed. After all, we had only two choices. Drift around in the vacuum of space until help came, or try to find shelter somewhere. Both options seemed equally daunting. What the hell are those things? Space maggots? Carter asked. I don't know. Whatever they are, they can't be allowed to go back to Earth. We reached the airlock of the ISS-14 and went inside. The entire ship seemed to be dark, so we turned on our belt flashlights. Should we close the hatch? Yeah, might as well. But if the station is infested, we might have a better chance surviving in a vacuum. So be ready for a quick venting. Adams then slowly propelled himself deeper into the station. Carter clicked the button to close the exterior airlock door, and once we were inside, he closed the interior one as well. Adams went ahead, the corridor illuminated by his flashlight like a wave of light. We followed him, nervously jumping at every tiny detail on the walls which resembled maggots or seemed like it was moving. All the doors are open except the control room. Okay, and so? They may have vented the station from there. Common procedures that in case any venting needs to be done, all astronauts are to put on their suits and head to the control room, Adams said. All right, well, let's see if anybody's inside. Adams nodded and pressed the button next to the door, and a message popped up. Warning, pressure inside the room is higher than the pressure outside. Do you wish to equalize pressure? Adams clicked on yes. Equalizing pressure now, stand by. The message read. The message blinked on and off for a few minutes and I felt myself becoming heavier, gradually as the gravity adjusted, until all four of us were with our feet on the floor, and the display turned green and red, pressure adjusted. Warning, emergency power is online, oxygen production is offline. Please use emergency O2 stations to replenish your O2. The door slid aside and we were met with the dim red glow of the control room. Immediately, we saw the body of an astronaut lying face down in the corner. Riley rushed to the crew member and turned to herself, but her look of vague hope turned to disappointment. She's dead. The rest of us approached and saw the astronaut's face. It was a young woman, no older than 30, blue in the face, but despite the color of her skin, she looked like she was sleeping peacefully. Her name tag said Moody. She's holding something, Carter said. We glanced down and saw what looked like a camcorder in her hand. Adam snatched it and opened it and the rest of us gathered around him. There was a folder open and Adams highlighted the first video by date. It started playing. The video was from the perspective of one of the astronauts, a male, judging by his voice. He was hovering above the ISS and zooming in on something on top of the ship. When he zoomed in enough, it became visible that there was some sort of red egg floating around. If he was saying anything, we couldn't hear him in the vacuum of space. The video then cut out and the next frame showed the astronaut gently holding the object from the previous footage in his hand. The red egg had veiny marks on it and it was slightly bigger than the astronaut's palm. The astronaut then flipped the egg from side to side, examining it curiously. The video then ended there, and Adams played the next one. The frame showed the egg from before, now in a glass display case, inside the station. What the hell is that? The person recording, now a female scientist, asked. No idea. Harrington found it outside and HQ wanted it brought back. Okay, well what if it's dangerous? The female astronaut asked. Well, whatever it is, it won't break this case. Nothing can. The scanner shows no signs of activity inside the egg, a third voice chimed in. 
The camera then zoomed in on the egg before the video ended abruptly, and Adams played the next one. This video showed the same room as before, but now the camera was placed on the desk, since we could see Moody sitting by it, facing the camera. Base wants the egg tested, she said to the camera. They don't want to risk bringing the egg to Earth, so I've been appointed as lead scientist. My job is to monitor the egg and conduct tests to see what's inside. So far, there's nothing strange about it itself. Maybe it's not even an egg. I'll continue to run tests to see. She then reached out for the camera and the video ended. The next video showed the same scene in a visibly more tired Moody. She rubbed her eyes and faced the camera before saying, Another egg was found today. Nilsson was performing a module check when he saw it. Despite initial skepticism, the egg will be taken back to base for study. There were apparently more, and all seemed to be coming from one direction. There may be a nest close by. As for this one, she looked back at the egg and then at the camera again. There seems to be some signs of minor activity inside. Hard to tell what it is, though. Whatever it is, it could be our actual first contact. She then ended the video, and I heard Carter mumble, Oh shit, under his breath. Adams then played the next one. The footage this time showed the same egg from before, but it was now cracked at the top and on the side. Tiny, crimson maggots were squirming around the display case lazily. What are those? Moody asked. Alien worms? A voice said next to her. Was the egg rotten? Nah, it didn't look like it. Maybe the worms are supposed to hatch out of it. I don't know. No idea. One of the maggots then started slithering on the glass, moving upwards. The camera zoomed in and I clearly saw the bodies of the maggots crawling over each other. It looked like they had tiny hairs on their bodies, and the video then ended. I felt itchy all over my body just watching it, unable to shake the feeling of bugs crawling all over me. The next video showed Moody in the same room. There were visibly a lot more maggots inside the display case now. They are reproducing at an enormous pace. The maggots seem to be dormant in the vacuum, but able to survive. Keith followed the trace where the eggs are coming back from and says he found their nest close by. It seems that this really is going to be our first contact. He hasn't responded to our call yet, though, so the signal must be bad there, Moody explained. The video ended and there was only one more video remaining, and Adam selected it and played it. The frame was very shaky, but we saw what was clearly the room from the previous footages. However, this time the glass display was broken and there were countless maggots all over the place covering every inch of the floor and every piece of item and furniture inside the room. The egg inside the display case was broken into pieces now and barely visible from all the maggots crawling all over it. Moody panted in panic and pressed the button to lock the door. She pointed the camera left, down the hallway, and thousands more maggots came into view. Moody then turned around and ran, and a blood-curdling scream was heard somewhere before it was completely silenced. Moody then ran inside the control room and turned around, and Harrington came into view, with a space suit on. He pressed the button to lock the door from the outside and shouted, Moody, vent the station. Wait, what about you and the others? No time, I'll open the airlock. Get ready. He ran out of view, ignoring Moody's plea to stop, and another scream was heard over Moody's radio. She stood in the room, panting in panic and looking over her shoulder. Moody, do it now, Harrington shouted over the radio. Moody approached a panel in the corner of the room and opened it, revealing a big switch. She grabbed it and held it hesitantly. Do it, Harrington shouted. Moody was audibly crying by this moment. With hesitation, she pulled the switch down and heard another short-lived scream. The video cut out and came back the following second. She pointed the camera towards herself. Tears were streaming down her face. She exhaled with a trembling voice and said, Oxygen production was damaged. I only have a few minutes left. HQ doesn't know what happened and everybody else is dead. All of the maggots have been vented out but the nest is still out there. Whoever finds this... You have to destroy the nest. It's close by. The coordinates are on the wall. She pointed the camera at a wall and we unanimously looked at the numbers on the wall which were still there. 
Moody took a few shallow breaths and then went on. Also, please send my final messages to my sister. Haley, I'm so sorry. You were right. Space is really awful. I wish I'd listened to you. I'm glad Mom isn't alive to witness this. And I'm sorry for being so stubborn. I'll always love you, little sister. She sniffled and cried before turning off the camera, and the four of us stared at the blank screen in silence. What are we going to do now? I asked. Adam sighed and gently placed the camcorder next to Moody's body. What are we going to do now? We're going to that fucking nest. Whoa, Captain, you can't be serious, Carter said. Carter, you can stay here if you like and act like a bitch. And same goes for you two. Wait for rescue if you like, but I'm going to finish this. No way, Captain. I'm coming with you, I said. Riley agreed to come too, and in the end, Carter threw his hands up in the air and said he'd come along as well. All right then. Let's go fucking do this, Adam said. We replenished our oxygen tanks and found whatever could be used as a weapon. There were no guns aboard the ISS, which probably wouldn't be useful against maggots anyway. So instead, we grabbed lighters, deodorant cans, and pieces of cloth that we could set on fire. Before we knew it, we were back outside in the dark vacuum of space. Adams led the way, propelling himself through with the three of us following closely behind. How do we even know how this place looks? Carter asked. For all we know, it could just be a floating nest and long gone from that location. No choice. We gotta find that thing. If not us... Someone else will have to do it. Well, Captain, we're not paid to do this sort of... Carter, if you're just going to bitch the whole time, then turn back and get the fuck out of here. Adam shouted through the radio. Carter didn't respond. We glided in silence for a while until Riley spotted some tiny object in the distance. It looked round and reddish. What is that? I asked, immediately suspecting to one thing. Adams flew there and grabbed the object, inspecting it curiously. He turned to us so that we could observe it as well. It's an egg, just like in Moody's footage, he said, letting the egg float. Indeed, it looked exactly like the red veiny egg in the video. I saw more details than in the video, though. In addition to the bulging veins, there were thin orange ones on the inside, visible on the surface. It reminded me of the time when I cracked open an egg and instead of the yolk, I saw an embryo of a chick. Adams grabbed his spray can and lighter. Everybody back up, he said, and he flicked the lighter on and the flame appeared, moving not upwards like normal in gravity, but dancing in various directions, almost like when blood starts to flow underwater. Adams put the spray can behind the flame and pressed the button. Although we heard no sound, we saw the wave of flame expanding like a torch and setting the egg afire. Immediately, We saw little maggots wiggling out and going for the captain, but Adams didn't let up on his flame, his face intense with revenge and anger, and the flame reflecting from his helmet. He was practically burning them to a crisp. Even after the egg was nothing more than a burnt shell, he kept burning it. Ah, Captain, you got him. I think you got him all now. Let's go, Carter said. Adams finally let up, observing his artistic piece of work before letting out one more gust of flame and then turned around. We were far ahead of the ISS by this point, a good 20 minutes since we left. The station seemed tiny from here, and we were mere specks of dust floating through space, surrounded by miles and miles of vast nothingness. Captain, we still on the right track? Adams kept quiet for a moment and then pointed over yonder. Riley, Carter, and I looked in the direction he was pointing at, and there it was some kind of an object in the distance. It was hard to tell what it was, but it looked rectangular, human-made, and not crude, like a piece of rock from space. And we started seeing more eggs frequently floating past us. But there were way too many to deal with individually, so we just let them be. As we got closer, it became clear that the object we were seeing was indeed like a cube. Greenish in color, with black lines going along the edges like columns. Is this it? Carter asked. It was big, a lot bigger than I anticipated, easily towering over 50 feet on each side. And right in front of us was a rectangle-shaped entrance 
near the bottom part of the cube object. One egg floated out of there, spinning in the air. Adams pushed it out of the way and illuminated the entrance. It had the same kind of green and black colors like on the exterior, but nothing noteworthy about it. He looked at me and gestured with his head for me to head in. I did as he said and gasped in awe at what I saw. The interior looked exactly like the exterior, but the greenish lines that went along the walls glowed in color that gave off the vibe of radioactive material, showering me and my crew members in sickly green. I realized that there were a few eggs thrown about, firmly stuck on the walls in some sort of gooey substance. What the fuck is this? Is this the nest? Captain, are you seeing this? When we got no response from Adams, we shot around to see what was going on, and before we realized what was happening, the exit slid shut and Adams was out of sight, the green glowing much brighter now. Captain, I shouted into my radio. For a moment, there was only silence, and then Adams finally spoke. I'm sorry, guys, I didn't want to do this. You see, these worms aren't just flesh-eating parasites. The maggots can devour things quickly, and they can reproduce quickly, too. But they're also intelligent beyond our comprehension. My heart was beating fast at this moment, and I got a bad feeling. Captain, open the fucking door! Carter slammed on the wall, which was previously an open space. And Adams continued. They can get inside the host and devour him from the inside out in a matter of seconds, taking control of the body. You see... Adams wasn't careful enough when evacuating the ship, and the three of you didn't care enough to check him for any marks. I can't allow you to stop this process. Carter started slamming the door harder, Riley visibly panicking, and I kept glancing around to see if any of the eggs had hatched yet. Just then, a voice came over our radio. ISS-14, this is HQ. Is anyone still alive out there? HQ, we're here. We got a situation here. I shouted into the radio. A moment later, HQ said again, This is HQ. Is anybody alive out there? I tried again, along with Riley and Carter to respond, but they couldn't hear us. And then Adams spoke. HQ, this is Captain Adams of the Collector. There are no other survivors. I'm on my way to you now. Copy that, Adams. We'll stand by. HQ responded. We tried contacting HQ again, but to no avail. Either Adams jammed our signal or it was blocked inside the structure. Just then, I caught something with my peripheral vision. One of the eggs had started to hatch and maggots were wiggling out of it. Carter was still busy slamming the door and trying to contact HQ, unaware of the eggs hatching. Then, he finally realized the severity of our situation and all three of us started propelling each other through the structure using spray cans and lighters to burn everything and anything that got anywhere close to our vicinity. We had the advantage of the structure being spacious and the worms not being able to jump around in the vacuum, so we were relatively safe, except for the ones that made their way accidentally to us. The structure itself seemed to wind around as a corridor, eggs and slime decorating most of its interior. I had started to lose hope and thought this place would become my tomb, leaving my body to float in the vacuum of space for hundreds of years. But then we saw the exit in the form of a square-shaped hole. We finally propelled ourselves out, turning around only to burn the rest of the maggots that stumbled outside. And then I heard Carter screaming, swatting at his own hand and trying to grab something, but it was too late. There was already a tiny hole in his suit, letting out a steady gust of air. Carter grabbed his helmet with both hands, and the shocking realization of what he was about to do hit me, and I tried to stop him. Carter then twisted, and his helmet came off. Instantly, his face started contorting into one of palpable pain and changing colors. I tried to put his helmet back on, but he pushed me and threw the helmet further away. You'd think that dying in the vacuum of space is a relatively quick process, but it's not. It's very slow and very painful. Carter convulsed, his face turning blue and bloating, his eyes turning bloodshot for what felt like minutes until he stopped moving completely and was left floating in the air as a rag doll. Ian, we gotta get moving. Riley was sobbing now, and I knew she was right. 
We tried contacting HQ again, but it didn't work. So we simply began gliding back to the ISS as fast as we could. We had to stop Adams, or whatever those maggots controlling him were. Around 20 minutes later, we finally got back and saw another ship waiting nearby. We were greeted by the crew members who needed a few minutes to understand what we were rambling on about. When I finally asked them about Adams, they said that he had already left with the other team. We tried to explain what had happened, but nobody believed us. We had to tell them to go and check out the structure for themselves, but to bring flamethrowers. That took another hour, and when they came back with two men less, they asked us to tell them everything from the start. Adams had made his way back to Earth by then, and when we came back, we got information that he volunteered to be on the team, which is running tests on the alien eggs brought back to Earth. Again, they refused to believe our claims that he was being controlled by some sort of space aliens. So we knew we had to take care of things ourselves. It's been two days now, but Riley and I managed to get back to base. I'm afraid that this will be my last mission, though. I discovered a tiny wound on my right hand when I got back to Earth. There's no pain or anything, but something is wrong. I can feel it. First, I lost control of my hand, and now my entire right arm. It's moving, but not on my own action. I can already feel part of my neck doing involuntary movement as well, so... I'm afraid I might be on my way out. Adams needs to be stopped and the eggs destroyed. Even so, I feel like this is a losing battle that we're fighting. The structure out in space was made by someone or something other than humans. And they put those eggs in there for a reason. If anyone is listening, please do whatever you can to alert the government and NASA there is a very dangerous alien intention at work here. We know they're on Earth now, and I fear for everyone's lives. <laughs>